Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Late? Yes, yes, but here nonetheless. And COVID positive. Some of us are COVID positive. It's a toss up. And some yeah. of us just got off tour and are sleep deprived. Who knows which is which? Yeah, who knows? Does it even matter? What a toss up. No. We're here. We're doing great thing, great things. You look great. Uh, I look great. Yeah, we both this, look great. This is great. Everything's this is great. great. We're great. Everything's great here. <laughs> Everything here is great. In the land of set phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. And everything is also great in the land of strange new worlds. Yes, or in the land of the Elysian Kingdom. Mm. Because today we're talking about uh, season one, episode eight of Strange New Worlds, entitled The Elysian Kingdom. Elysian Uh, Kingdom. (laughs) The Elysian Kingdom is how I would like the title always to be said. Uh, it is star date four one eight six two eight point seven. And before we get into the whole episode, I guess we got to do our little preamble. We got to talk about Patreon. 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 If you would like to uh, participate in a uh, medieval, in fact, it's not medieval, a Renaissance medieval. form oh. of uh, supporting your artist friends, such as they did in the Renaissance period, not unlike the uh, episode from Strange New Worlds this week. You can join us on patreon.com forward slash set phases where we will get together, have Zoom hangouts. You can watch. I'm, I'm sure we should probably put on an episode about uh, Aki, Aki teaching us how to tie a bow tie. That could oh, be our be next. Lovely. That I would could, be lovely. I don't know who would enjoy that, but I would love to teach people how to tie a bow tie. I think just watching you do it and explaining it would be quite fun. And then we could go through your numerous bow ties, perhaps. Oh, God, I would love to share my bow tie collection with people. <laughs> Oh, dear. Well, uh, in in order to do so, all you need to do is join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash set phases. Yes. And you can have fun. Yes. Oh, and I'm home now, so maybe we can finally do some Zoom hangs. Yes, yeah, let's do some Zoom yeah. hangs. Fun Fantastic. with bow ties. With fun with bow ties. Next Zoom hang, bow tie centric. So that'll probably drum our numbers up real, oh, yeah. <laughs> real big. Uh All right, well, let's run it down. Let's run down this episode. The Elysian Kingdom. It's time to run it down. Can you run it down for me? What just happened? Can you run it down for me? The Enterprise is conducting a survey outside the Jonesian Nebula. There's not much for Dr. Mbenga to do. So he's in his office, scanning his daughter, whom you may remember is suffering from synechemia. She wants him to stop and read the story he always reads to her again. So he does. But as he's reading the end of the story, why am I talking like this? As he's reading the end of the story, it feels compelling. As he's reading the end of the story, Rukia, his daughter, says, "Uh, This ending sucks. I wish it was different. I wish that Sir Adya and the Huntress would end up together fighting for each other but dr umbenga explains that the king has been forced to choose between his greatest weapon the mercury stone or saving his princess uh he tells rukia when she's grown that she'll be able to write her own stories and rukia asks when she's able to see will she be able to see his quarters when he's better and doc says he'll show her the whole ship then he puts her back in the pattern buffer afterwards He takes some of those samples and tries to do some work that literally blows up in his face. Uh, Number one, Una enters and asks him why he hasn't cleared the shuttle crew for active duty yet. He explains he got caught up and says he'll get right to it. But uh, when number one inquires about his work with Rukia, he says she's running out of time, even living in the pattern buffer. Uh, Una reminds him of his duties as chief medical officer, uh, but she also tells him to get some sleep. 
<clears throat> Meanwhile, on the bridge. <laughs> oh, thank God. I was wondering I kind of how that, that was going to go on. For Meanwhile, it. on the bridge, the boys, the boys are back. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The, the bo- boys. The boys uh, from the survey are back, <laughs> and the survey of the nebula is complete. And Pike is happy that it was just a nice, calm, chill scientific mission. And Spock reminds him that, hey, you know, humans are superstitious about, you know, talking about how good things are when they're still happening. And Pike's like, don't worry about it, Spock. I didn't know you were so superstitious. And then he orders Ortega to set course for the McNair Starbase. And he says he's buying drinks for the whole crew. And he tells Ortega to hit it. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. Uh, They try to figure out what's going on. It's weird. Spock reads that there's a small synchrotron. 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 I think synchrotron is the word. I don't know. Flux from the nebula, and it may be affecting the ship's ability to form a warp bubble. Uh, Pike calls down to Hammer. Hammer says, hey, the engines are fine. We got warp engines. Uh, And, you know, he's like, maybe we try getting clear of this nebula uh, in order to be able to make a sustainable warp bubble and then see what happens. We'll do it on impulse. Uh, So they try to go to impulse. The ship judders, rocks hard, Ortegas hits their head, falls down. Pike calls to Mbenga for an emergency uh, medical thing. The doctor is in his quarters having, you know, taken a nap he was supposed to take. He says he's en route. He goes up in the turbo lift feeling really weird and tired and out of it. And when he gets to the bridge, it ain't the bridge. It's a Renaissance court, as Stevie said. Everyone in Renaissance attire. Uh, and Umbenga has a crown because he is, uh, how, do, how do you say en français, the king? La reine. La reine? Or is the that reine? the queen? Oops. Ray? La reine. Ray? Sans ray. ray? I don't forget how to say king in French. Uh, let's Google it, shall we? Let's Google that. Uh, oh, wait, was the music? Listen, it's... If you want to, you can Google that. Google that. Le roi! Le roi! Yes, yes, yes. May, of course it is. Le roi. He is le roi. They all say, hail the king. Everyone bows, and we hit the credits. So, when we come back, Mbenga's like, uh, I was called here to check on Ortegas, and they're like, Ortegas, who are you talking about? Pike is there. Pike is sort of a, a sort of foppish lord, the chamberlain, uh, what's his name? Ralph? Roth? Oh, I forgot. Uh, spelled Ralph, but it's, it's pronounced Roth. Or something like that. Uh, and he goes, Ortegas, you must mean Sir Adia. And there is Ortegas dressed up as a knight uh, with a sword and everything. And the doctor's like, what are you guys trying to play a joke on me? And then Pike, as Sir Amund Roth, uh, says, oh, do you, if you want to hear a joke, we could call the jester. Uh, but Mbenga weighs him off. And I do wonder who the jester would have been if they had gone down that road. Um, but anyway, uh, Pike uh, offers, Pike slash Roth, this is going to be one of those episodes where I have to deal with people having two personalities, and bear with me. Ah, you have a I think if they had used this person to play their opposite, if you like, then it, I think it would have been Hemmer. Right, if it had been someone completely out of place, oh, you think Hemmer would have wound up being the jester. Yes. Oh, that would have been so weird. It would have been weird, but everyone's yes. playing opposite to character, so I think yes, Hepper- Hammer would have been the, the appropriate choice. This is true. But he was able to fend off, uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, he was, a he was able to fend off the, ent- the entity. Okay, so uh, he sits down in the chair, and then he's confused as to what's going on. Pike uh, and Ortegas as Roth and Adia obviously have an enmity, a sort of a, a, a relationship of... Uh, distrust and distaste for one another, you know, arguing as as courtiers do. Uh, Mbenga tries to consult the computer to figure out what's going on, which everyone refers to as the Oracle. And he's worried that the chemical that he was using in the bay that exploded in his face may have had an effect on the crew. So he wants to go to sick bay. Side note, Pike wonders where the bay is and whether they need a ship to get there. Ha 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 ha. And he mentions a mysterious fog around them as an ill omen sent by their enemy, Queen Nev. Uh, of course, he's referring to the Jonesian Nebula, which is uh, still on the viewports. Uh, and Mbenga's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go get a magical device called a tricorder. You guys stay here. He goes down to sick bay. I mean, every, the whole ship is covered in like vines and trees and set up like a really bad uh, or really good junior high school play of Into the Woods or something. <laughs> uh, and in the sick bay, uh, Nurse Chapel is Lady Audrey. 
uh, sort of uh, bush witch magic lady shaman living in the she's just stirring like a pot a or something healer should we should we call her a healer healer yes healer shaman uh but those are her wit it doesn't matter uh so on his way down there he's in the woods everyone's bowing to him on the way he gets the tricorder he sees that everything's normal with himself he runs the tricorder over nurse chapel slash lady lady audrey she has increased dopamine levels which just means that her brain is very very active according to him Pike and Ortegas arrive, even though they were ordered not to, and say that they had to because Princess Talia insisted on seeing him. Who's Princess Talia? Well, you're right. It is someone playing completely against type. La'an comes in as Princess Talia. Total, like, uh, aristocratic, out of touch, holding a tiny lapdog that she refers to uh, like a baby. Uh, she says, Nev and the Crimson Guard invaded her kingdom looking for the Mercury Stone. <gasps> the Mercury Stone, like from the book. And she barely escaped with her life and her dog, Runa. Laon says she showed up. Uh, Laon slash uh, Princess Talia says she came to uh, his, uh, to Mbanga slash his king something or other, I forget already, uh, his kingdom, uh, because she knew that he had the Mercury Stone. And she asked where it is, and he says, oh, it's safe, even though he's, he's clearly lying. He runs a tricorder over Laon. She also has high dopamine levels. Meanwhile, Ortegas offers to lead an attack against the Crimson Guard, and Mbenga has to dissuade her. Just as that's happening, however, there is a commotion out in the hallway, and it's Hammer being dragged away by the very same, the, the, the aforementioned Crimson Guard, who are led by uh, Mitchell, who was uh, working at the helm aside Ortegas. So uh, the two sort of like fighters for the two factions, Ortegas is fighting for uh, Mbenga, and Mitchell is fighting for this Queen Nev, whomever that might wind up to be. Uh, and Hammer seems unaffected by whatever's going on, but he's dressed uh, nonetheless uh, like like uh, like Mbanga in character. He's the wizard caster. Uh, he orders his release, but Mitchell doesn't follow orders, despite the fact that Lady Audrey's woods are supposed to be neutral territory. Uh, but uh, Nev is no longer going to observe that because Nev is going to... Excuse me, because Nev is going to take over all of the lands, including uh, Mbenga's, the king's land. Uh, so they drag Hammer into the turbo lift, and Hammer, who's unaffected, and Mbenga, who are unaffected, manage to communicate, and Hammer is like, I'll come save you. So, Ortegas, when the doors close, as Adia says, we must use the Mercury Stone, Zaya. Uh, and Mbenga says, actually, I don't have the Mercury Stone. However, we must save Castor, because he knows where it is. Another lie, but he sees it. Hammer's the only other person who's not affected by this, so he needs to get to him. They go to the conference room where Pike slash Chamberlain Roth shows them a map of the Enterprise. Now, uh, uh, like a paper, like one of those paper hand-drawn Renaissance maps with the Enterprise now is the Kingdom of Elysian. Excuse me. The Kingdom of Elysian. Uh, and Hammer shows, they show that Hammer will be in Neve's, uh, Nev's dungeons, which is basically by the navigation deflector. And Laon is telling uh, them not to go. And Pike doesn't want to go either because he's, supposed to be sort of a coward and Abenka says listen we will go uh we're going to try diplomacy first and if that doesn't work then he gives Ortegas uh permission to start cutting people in half as Ortegas has been wanting to do and Ortegas says that her sword starfall is itching for battle and then uh, uh Ortegas as Adia and Pike as Roth uh, fall to bickering uh, but he anyway tells uh, Laan as Princess Talia to stay behind with her dog Runa and stay safe. And then Pike tries to stay behind, but Mbenga commands him to come. They are uh, walking through the forest trying to get to uh, Queen Nev's territory. There are crimson banners all through the, quote, forest, which is just the hallway again with a bunch of, uh, uh, like, uh, elementary school play vines all over the place. Uh, Ortegas runs out in front, says, we're not alone, draws her sword. And then Spock is revealed as the wizard Pollux. He's surprised to see Mbenga headed to Nev's through the swamp of infinite deaths. Surely they will not make it. But Mbenga solicits uh, Pollux slash Spock's... What a sentence. Pollux slash Spock's help in finding Castor. And Spock says, why should I help? And Mbenga says, because I know that Castor is your brother. Because he knows that from the book. And promises not to use Castor, but to free him. Pollux agrees to therefore take them around the swamp through a dark way that will allow them to get to the court. The dark way, i.e. Jeffrey's tube. Uh, Ortegas Adia mentions to Mbenga as the king, uh, worried about this might be a trap, and Mbenga's like, yeah, it's a trap, baby, but we gotta do it anyway. 
They get to Nev's kingdom, and guess who's Nev? Who's the evil queen? Ahura, uh, with uh, spiked pal are those pauldrons, things that come off your shoulders. Apple I actually lights? don't know what, what those things? are called. She's got spiked shoulder pads. They go high, uh, and she's 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 chewing the scenery in the way that only an evil queen can do, sitting sideways in the chair and lounging in the chair and, 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 and all the stuff that evil evil queens and stuff do. It's pretty great. Um, uh, Spock then betrays uh, Banga and et al. And he has been working for Nev the whole time. And Nev demands the Mercury Stone and Banga says it could be anywhere. And Nev says, fine, then I'll have my torturers have at you. And since you're so eager to find Caster, you can join him in the dungeon. So, they're thrown in the dungeons. Uh, Mbanga, uh, uh, Pike, and uh, Ortegas as their other people. And also, Kasser, Hammer, is there. The doc relates that everyone's acting out the parts in the book that he reads to his daughter. And Hammer wonders why the two of them are not affected. The doc says at least Hammer can help solve the real problem, regardless of all this story stuff. And Hammer mentions that he was in engineering. The last thing he remembers before all this went crazy, and he felt a powerful entity tried to take him over. Uh, and maybe that same entity got the story out of the doc's head and is applying it to the ship. Uh, Hammer says he couldn't recontact with that, reconnect with that enemy, with that entity, because the first contact was so unpleasant that that's why he used his, uh, his, uh, what do you call it? Uh, psycho, psych, psycho, 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 what's, what's it? You know, telepathic training, uh, to keep it out of his mind. Uh, but he knows that the entity is not in the ship. It's in the nebula. The doc wonders if they can figure it out, if they can get access to the ship's scanners. Hammer believes that they can do that, but first they must escape. How will they do so? He says he will do it with a powerful magic called science. He has a laser cutter on him. So Hammer <clears throat> goes to cut open the lock. Uh, he asks the, the doctor what a human magician might say at that moment. The doc says, offers abracadabra. Hammer uses it, says, nice, I like it. He tells others to look away because the blindness, the brightness will blind them. Of course, he is already blind. Uh, and when Pike asks, what about Hammer? Hammer says, I am a wizard. He cuts the lock and they get out. Uh, we find we flash to Nev, who's very upset about losing the prisoners. And instead of but instead of killing Mitchell, she sends Mitchell and the Crimson Guard with Pollock slash Spock to hunt the doctor down and find out what they're up to. Uh, so as they finally get close to engineering, uh, the doctor and all are blocked by Mitchell and the guard and Spock and Adia Ortega steps up to defend. And Mitchell says, how will you defend? You're unarmed. You just escaped from the dungeons. But then as one of the Crimson Guards comes forward, uh, Ortega beats the crap out of them and takes one of the swords and says that she's armed herself. Uh, Pike, uh, meanwhile, who's, you remember, playing a total coward, runs away. Uh, Hammer's shocked, but the doc notes that Roth's character in the book is not known for their bravery. Ortegas is getting slightly overwhelmed. Mitchell comes in for the kill. An arrow flies, knocking people about in asunder. And uh, uh, Pollux runs for a retreat. And so does Mitchell saying, this is not over. And who is their rescuer? None other than Una as Zamira, the Huntress. Uh, so they hurry into engineering. Hammer scans the nebula, discovers a single entity within no physical body, and asks Mbenga if he knows about the Boltzmann brain theory, which I shall supply for you, the listener, now. It is a spontaneously generated consciousness that forms without a body, and this may be one of them. Uh, if it got the story out of Mbenga's brain, then maybe severing the connection between Mbenga and this Boltzmann brain would end the effect. And Una, as the Zamira the Huntress, offers to shoot the king, which Ortegas interposes to stop them from doing. And then Mbenga realizes something is not right. Because as you may recall from the cold open, Zamira the Huntress and uh, Sir Adia do not get together in the book. But it is what, why am I talking like William Shatner? But it is what his daughter Rukia wanted to have happen. And that's when he realized this is Rukia's version of that story being played out. Where's Rukia? They hustle to sickbay, only to discover that the transporter is empty and Rukia is not there. <laughs> And Benga sees that. I'm sorry, I was still inhaling. And Benga sees that Rukia was <laughs> was taken uh, from the transporter earlier that day and beams somewhere on the ship, but he can't figure out where, and thinks she is the key 
to getting them out of the situation. Little does he know that Pollux, <laughs> the evil wizard who turned from them, played by Spock, is waiting just outside his corridor. And he hears this and smiles to himself and goes to report to Queen Neb. Now Neb is curious to know that the Mercury Stone must be this little girl of which they speak. And she says she'll take it for her own. How? <laughs> well, her guards have captured Pike. So Pike is dragged in. He begs for his life because he's a complete coward. Uh, Neb says he can live. He just must be loyal to her. And he, of course, says, well, oh, fine, of course, happy. And he bows. Meanwhile, Mbenka et al. are working to try and figure out where Rakia was sent. Una, as the hunters, he has to call the forest and goes off. Hammer suggests that maybe they're looking at this the wrong way and that maybe if Rakia is in charge of this whole scenario, where would she have wanted to go? And remember from the conversation also in the cold open that she wanted to see Mbenka's quarters, her father's quarters. So they rush there and are confronted by Pike, who detains them and reveals his treachery. Nev, Pollux, and the Crimson Guard reveal themselves. Uh, the Doc threatens, therefore, to bring the full might of the power of the kingdom down on them if they try to hurt his daughter. And Hammer plays along, and he does a bunch of weird stuff, and he says a bunch of weird things. And then he uses a communicator to beam them all into a cargo bay. Doc finally enters the quarters, finds Rakia dressed as the little princess, scans her, finds out that she's completely healed. Rakia says this was all set up by her friend, and they're having a really good fun time. It's the entity in the nebula, and Benga explains that even though all that's great, the friend that Rakia has is hurting his friends, and Rakia has to get them to stop, and Rakia wonders if that will mean she'll have to go back into the transporter, and Dr. Mbenga doesn't know if that's going to be the case, and then Hammer comes in, he says, listen, I said I wasn't going to do it before, but I think I can do it now. If you want to talk to this entity, I'll telepathically link with them, but please be gentle! So he telepathically links with the entity. It looks a little painful, but then they start talking. And the entity says that if the ship leaves their area, Rukia will die. But the doc, so the doc must make a choice. Either the crew will live or his daughter will live, right? Uh, and the doc says, no, 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 there must be another way. And so the entity says, well, there is another way. Rukia could stay. And the entity offers, uh, could live in uh, the, the nebula with me, but without her body. The body is what's sick. The mind is still powerful. And the ship could go. Uh, so Rakia asks if the doctor can come to her father, and uh, he says that he doesn't think that he can, that this is like the story, that he must make a choice to save his daughter. Uh, Rakia, understanding that, chooses to go with her friend where she won't be sick. Uh, Hammer shakes, passes out, light comes out of his body, surrounds Rakia, who says it tickles, and she goes flying out into the nebula. And then she comes flying back from the nebula, and she's older. And she says, hey, I've been having a great time with Dr. Deborah, with Deborah, the entity. And you don't have to be sad, Dad, even though I left a second ago. It's been years for me. I try to be happy. You did the right thing. And we're going to meet again someday. And uh, I got to go. Bye. And so she flies away again. But we get to see an adult Rakia, apparently, who looks a lot like her mother, which causes the doc to cry, but to be happy. And then as she goes away again and the light fades, the doc is back in his uniform. Hammer regains consciousness and he complains of a headache and wonders why he's in the doc's quarters. The final scene, the doctor is uh, in his office once again looking at the book. None of the crew seems to remember what happened. They just, they just lost five hours uh, and only he knows what happens. Now, side note, this play, if it was five hours long, ugh, I don't know if I could stand it, but... Anyway, uh, Una arrives and asks about Rakia, and that's when he reveals that she's gone, but she's alive and she's safe. And then Una realizes that the doctor knows what happens and says it sounds like a hell of a story. And then looking at the last page of the storybook, the doctor says it all begins as good stories do once upon a time. And here endeth episode eight, season one, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, entitled The Elysian Kingdom. Let's chat about it. I say, darling, let's do a quick chat about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah. let's do. Are you, what are you doing? You're punching the air? I'm just celebrating being able oh. to get through that rundown. Um, well yes, done. I was punching the air. Enjoyable voices. Yes, I find that uh, acting like a complete maniac helps me really get through the narration. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, thoughts? Wasn't it quite the fun romp? It was a fun romp. I thought it was like a real, um, like a holodeck style episode. Yes, you know? very much. But, but they just did. I love the make-believe and all that. It was very fun. Much to do about hijinks. Much to do about hijinks. Everyone playing opposite of type. An evil, mm -hmm. smiling, smirking to himself Spock and a weak, yellow-bellied pike. And it was very fun. Also a bit of Rukia as traveler kind of situation. Yes, it was a bit. Right. Does every Enterprise have a child that uh, goes to live as an entity among the stars? 
Why not? You know, she doesn't have super cool powers. She's just living disembodied with a giant brain and a gas cloud, I guess. But I mean, it was a tough. It was a tough decision. I think that Mbenga, you know, whilst it was such a fun episode at the end, there was a really, really heartfelt moment that really yeah. got mm-hmm. me. That was really, really sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. Un- they underscored that like he was not getting anywhere with this cure. You know. And so it was sort of like she can live, uh, and that's kind of the option. Also, it's nice that he got to see her older. Like she comes back immediately and is like, "Hey, Dad!" Right. And I think that was the you've made the right decision here. Yes. Versus leaving it, which I feel like that's probably been the choice that Voyager maybe you know has made time and time again. Just like Mm -hmm. the unknown, and you have to live with these decisions. Yes. Yeah. Mm. It was cute. I really love Ortega's as Sir Adia. Just kind of kicking butt and uh yeah i thought it was like it wasn't too heavy-handed it was just a light sort of i mean it was that one part at the end was intense but yeah. hammer having fun pretending you know being all dramatic and over the top about the oh, he was science. he was brilliant when, like the, yeah. there was something that maybe his fingers aren't you know ma- you know a bit more prosthetic but there was something yeah. he did with his fingers when he did abracadabra <laughs> that was just yeah one of the best physical things of comedy i've seen for a yes. while it's very it very so well. well done super fun he and he blows on that uh laser cutter yes. after he keep like a six shooter which is very it's just so silly i really enjoyed it uh you know no true big lasting things except that rukia is now we don't have to there's no plot of the doctor also worried about his dot do- trying to cure his daughter so maybe he can focus on his job a bit more but we only have two episodes left, you know? I think we must return at some point to Pike's future. Because we haven't talked well, about it. We, we haven't had a, a flash forward or a thought about that for a couple yeah. of episodes. But we also have the La'an's uh, people. The Gorn. The Gorn. That's true, the Gorn. Ooh, fun fact. Did you know that La'an's or Christina Chong's d- dog, Runa, was actually her real dog? Didn't know that. There you go. I, I, I believe it because she truly manhandled that thing as if it was her own. So that's cute. It's also got to be fun to be like, oh, I'll just bring my dog. If <laughs> we need a part for a dog, and you're like, what about mine? Uh, that's lovely. Well, I think what happened was that her dog, <laughs> she got a dog during the pandemic, doesn't everyone? And she started an Instagram for it, which has done quite well. Mm-hmm. And then I think she asked the showrunner because apparently they only got the scripts for this episode they knew that this episode was coming but they didn't get the script until like a night or two before Mm. and when they knew it was coming she said to the showrunner hey is there any chance this considering this is a pretty bonkers episode is there a chance to get my dog in it so that's that's what they did and her dress my goodness um yes they apparently that i i imagine that was quite expensive because they did a, a balayage thing on it um, it was quite. Beautiful. I don't know what balayage means. When's when you've got like two different colors and it's sort of like a, or like an ombre type thing. Oh, I see. Okay, yes. Mm. Um, but yes, it was quite quite remarkable. Everyone had a lot of fun. But the dog, yes, Christina Chong's actual dog, Runa, Princess Runa. Runa. Mm. Oh, her actual dog's name is actually Runa. Yes. Oh, that's cute. I didn't Runa. know that. That's yep. lovely. In it. Uh, in it. In it. In it. Um, that's all I've got. Do you have any uh, news today? There is no news, unfortunately. Uh, oh. Nothing's really come out for a while. I, spe- I expect they're waiting for Comic Con to announce some sure. new things. They're probably waiting for Comic Con. There's a lot of stuff happening right now. We only got two episodes left in the season. Come on, bad boys. Well, let's go to quotable moments then, shall we? Quotable moments. Well, I only have a couple. There are a lot of like great dialogue moments in this episode and mm. some fun, as you say, physical comedy moments uh like when pike as uh roth says i think i should return to the castle and then just sprints away from the battle that's very funny um i very much enjoyed spock saying in the beginning when he mentions the uh the whole thing about humans being uh being superstitious he says scans indicate a minor psychroton flux psychrotron flux emanating from within inside the nebula perhaps that has affected our warp capabilities or Perhaps you did indeed jinx it. Mm-hmm. That was quite cute. Indeed. One super badass moment for Ortegas 
uh, when they're attacked uh, by the Crimson Guards. He says, get out of our way. And Mitchell says, the Crimson Guard says, or what? You're unarmed. And then Ortegas proceeds to to very rapidly um, take yeah, down the Crimson him. Guard and get a sword and say, I have armed myself. <laughs> I love that. That was good. <laughs> Quite good. I had a couple. I had, yeah. um, mo- actually, they're all Ortegas. She, they, she really had the best lines in this. She did. She that, well, list. she and Hemmer. I think, mm, yes. Yeah. yes. I think she had the best lines, but Hemmer had the best scene. Yeah, moments. Why not? Big acting moments. So when um, Ortegas was with number one, and they were, you know, acting as, as lovers, and mm-hmm. um, uh, Ortega said, you said you'd call on me. It's been a busy time. <laughs> a raven would have been too much trouble. Right. Yes, that was very cute. Good. <laughs> you said and, you'd call on me. <laughs> and Ortega's to Captain Pike, um, who was, you know, the bumbling foppish mm-hmm. chap. It's hard to hear over the sound of your trembling boots. I do remember that. That's a very oh, good a one. Good one. Well, well, yes. And my last one was, uh, you know, when... Um, Hemmer gets them out of the, the jail with his laser you know, pen. Not bad, wizard. I like this science. <laughs> I like this science. Uh, and speaking of Hammer, my last quote uh, that I enjoyed is when he says, turn away now or I'll unleash the full power <laughs> of my powerful wizard. The, wizard. the powers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you to the event horizon. Uh, that was great. That was, uh, listen, those are quotable moments. Let's get into next time. Next time on Set Phasers. Oh, hell yeah. I don't know. I thought I'd try something new. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's going to clip in the audio, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Do you, want to, do you want me to take it again a little bit quiet? Sure, try it. Try it again. <laughs> Oh, hell yeah. This is next time. (laughs) Well, I might be tired. It's tickling me to no end. Anyway, next time we'll be talking about the penultimate episode of the season, uh, episode nine, entitled All Those Who Wander. All Those Who Wander, which I think is a quote from, uh, uh, I think it might be Lord of the Rings. Or Robert Frost. I can't remember who says it. Oh, I think the full thing is all those who wander are not lost. Yeah. And I can't remember if that's from a fictional character's wisdom or from an actual poet in real life. Um, that's a look. It is... All who wander are not lost. Tolkien. It is Tolkien. Okay, so it's those... Gandalf talking about Aragorn. Yes, not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are roots. not reached mm-hmm. by the frost. And all that is gold does not glitter. That's how it starts. That's why. Yes. All that is gold does not glitter. And all who wander are not lost. Frodo. Okay, so we're watching uh, Lord of the Rings next week. and uh, We will not be doing that. We will be watching the director's cut, the four and a half hour version of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the take with pen, the songs put it with all the songs eye? no no you don't want to hear the and we'll sing along okay well if you enjoyed what you heard and are not feeling threatened by the fact that uh, I like musicals then you can listen to all episodes of set phasers uh, on wherever you get your podcasts okay folks wherever you get podcasts we have them we've got back order uh, back order why do I keep saying that like we're selling shirts we have back issues we've been dealing with every new franchise of Trek that includes Discover uh, Picard uh, Lower Decks and now Strange New Worlds did I forget anything I don't Discovery, think so. Picard, I think those are the four we dealt with yeah so gosh Hours and hours of entertainment await you, should you desire to do so. Mm. Uh, and you feel free to rate and subscribe, uh, or subscribe, and then re- do whatever you want. But it would be nice to get some reviews up of that bad boy. That would be nice. Yeah, thanks so much. And you can, of course, follow us at Set Phasers and at Set Phasers Podcast on the Instagram and Facebook, respectively. Hashtag Meme Game Strong. Hashtag Meme Game Strong. We also have a website. I think it's setphaserspod.com. Podcast.com. Setphaserspodcast.com. It's it's quite good. And it's a quite, actually, yes, it is a good website. Just go look at it. Admire it. Did you know you could leave us a voice note? Hey, if you wanted to rant at us. You could leave us a voice note on our, why aren't we putting that up top? Oh, gosh. You know what? The next two episodes of this show. We gotta talk. Oh shit! Do people know what number episode this is? Is this a big oh, fuck. episode? Is this, Should we not talk it? about oh, it till next time? Oh crap! Bags. Um, 
Let me just, I will. Let's just will, say this is, uh, we're approaching a third digit. We are approaching our third digit. Our, it's very exciting. I think you might have said it might be this one. Oh, I think I fucking did. Oops. I'm, it's, it's really, off. oh shit, yes. This is, this is 100. <laughs> and I'm going to sneeze. Oh dear. Oh, uh, uh, you stole oh, it. Oh, you stole it. Uh, oh, this is COVID. This is fun. My hundred, our hundredth episode is me with COVID, and you. Well. Uh, oh, I'm barely making sense. Yes. <laughs> um, oh uh, hell yeah. Well, we'll celebrate our hundredth episode some other time, some other way. Indeed. When we're not uh, sick. Uh, okay. Uh, I think this is the thing you do. Is it? What do I do? You Thank say, you for listening. Uh, you say your I'm Stevie name Mans. Goodbye. You, yeah. Yes. Thank you for listening. I'm Stevie Mans. We'll see you next time. And I'm, uh, oh shit, what did I write? Oh, and I'm from a dark realm full of chaos and monsters. And this has been Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Computer. End program. Computer and program.